A very warm welcome to St. Paul's Cathedral on this Sunday in the year when the Church celebrates the 19th Sunday after Trinity. Wherever you're from, it's good to have you with us this afternoon. And we welcome members of the Occupy movement who are here today, and also members of the Seventh Rifles who are here for a wreath laying after this service. The preacher this afternoon is the Reverend Dr. David Eisen, Dean of St. Paul's. Here begins the 13th verse of the fifth chapter of the book of Joshua. Once when Joshua was near Jericho, he looked up and saw a man standing before him with a drawn sword in his hand. Joshua went to him and said to him, Are you one of us or one of our adversaries? He replied, Neither, but as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshipped. And he said to him, What do you command your servant, my Lord? The commander of the army of the Lord said to Joshua, Remove the sandals from your feet, for the place where you stand is holy. And Joshua did so. Now Jericho was shut up inside and out because of the Israelites. No one came out and no one went in. The Lord said to Joshua, See, I have handed Jericho over to you, along with its king and soldiers. You shall march around the city, all the warriors circling the city once. Thus you shall do for six days, with seven priests bearing seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark. On the seventh day, you shall march around the city seven times, the priests blowing the trumpets. When they make a long blast with the ram's horn, as soon as you hear the sound of the trumpet, then all the people shall shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city will fall down, and all the people shall charge straight ahead. So Joshua, son of Nun, summoned the priests and said to them, Take up the Ark of the Covenant, and have seven priests carry seven trumpets of ram's horns in front of the Ark of the Lord. To the people he said, Go forward and march around the city. Have the armed men pass on before the Ark of the Lord. As Joshua had commanded the people, the seven priests carrying the seven trumpets of ram's horns before the Lord went forward, blowing the trumpets with the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord following them. And the armed men went before the priests who blew the trumpets. The rear guard came after the Ark while the trumpets blew continually. To the people, Joshua gave this command. You shall not shout or let your voice be heard, nor shall you utter a word until the day I tell you to shout. Then you shall shout. So the ark of the Lord went around the city, circling it once, and they came into the camp and spent the night in the camp. Then Joshua rose early in the morning, and the priests took up the ark of the Lord, the seven priests carrying the seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark of the Lord passed on, blowing the trumpets continually. The armed men went before them, and the rear guard came after the ark of the Lord, while the trumpets blew continually. On the second day they marched around the city once, and then returned to the camp. They did this for six days. On the seventh day they rose early, at dawn, and marched around the city in the same manner seven times. It was only on that day that they marched around the city seven times. 
And at the seventh time, when the priests had blown the trumpets, Joshua said to the people, Shout, for the Lord has given you the city. The city and all that is in it shall be devoted to the Lord for destruction. Only Rahab the prostitute and all who are with her in her house shall live, because she hid the messengers we sent. As for you, keep away from the things devoted to destruction, so as not to covet and take any of the devoted things and make the camp of Israel an object for disruption, bringing trouble upon it. But all silver and gold and vessels of bronze and iron are sacred to the Lord. They shall go into the treasury of the Lord. So the people shouted and the trumpets were blown. As soon as the people heard the sound of the trumpets, they raised a great shout and the wall fell down flat. So the people charged straight ahead into the city and captured it. Here ends the first lesson. Here begins the 20th verse of the 11th chapter of the Gospel of Matthew. Jesus began to reproach the cities in which most of his deeds of power had been done because they did not repent. Woe to you, Chorazin! Woe to you, Bethsaida! For if the deeds of power done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I tell you, on the day of judgment, it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon than for you. And you, Capernaum, will you be exalted to heaven? No, you will be brought down to Hades. For if the power, deeds of power done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. But I tell you, on the day of judgment, it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom than for you. At that time, Jesus said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and the intelligent and have revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all you that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Here ends the second lesson. I'd like to express my delight at being here in this magnificent house of worship today, on the eve of the anniversary of the Occupy London movement. Occupy London, or occupying in London, may have started on the steps of St Paul's Cathedral, but it exists to challenge the City of London and the injustice of our financial systems. Occupy Faith grew out of those occupiers who were seeking a just way forward as people of faith. God calls on us as people of faith and as Christians to have the courage to speak out against injustice. Indeed, it is our moral obligation to do so, for silence is a betrayal, and those who remain apathetic and silence in opposing injustice are just as complicit as those who perpetrate the crimes of injustice in the first place. So I ask you to bow your heads as we pray for peace and love and unity. May God bless us with discomfort at easy answers, half-truths, and superficial relationships, so that we may live deeply within our hearts. May God bless us 
with anger at injustice, oppression, and exploitation of people and the earth. May God bless us with tears to shed for those who suffer from pain, hunger, homelessness, war, and rejection, so that we may reach out our hand to comfort them and turn their pain to joy. And may God bless us with enough foolishness to believe that we can make a difference in the world, so that we can do what others claim cannot be done. In Jesus' name, Amen. We continue in our prayers in praying for the life of the Church. As we pray for the Christian communities from which we've come, so we pray for the mission of God's Church throughout the world, especially for the churches of the Anglican Communion, for Rowan, Archbishop of Canterbury, and today for the province of the West Indies, for John, their Archbishop and Bishop of Barbados. We pray for the life and witness of this cathedral church, joining our voices of prayer and praise with all who have called upon the name of God in this place today. Look upon our lives, O Lord our God, and make them thine in the power of thy Holy Spirit, that we may walk in thy way, faithfully believing thy word, faithfully doing thy commandments, faithfully worshipping thee, and faithfully serving our brothers and sisters, all to the furtherance of thy glorious kingdom. This we ask through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. In our prayers we give thanks to God for the many blessings which we enjoy in our daily lives, for the love and support of family and friends, for food and shelter. We pray for generosity of heart and spirit to share with others that which God so generally gives to us. So we pray too for the communities from which we've come, for those who serve their varied needs, for those who are peacekeepers and reconcilers, for those who bring aid to those who are hungry and homeless. We pray too for those communities torn apart by warfare and violence. So we give thanks to God for the peace and the security in which we live. Heavenly Father, to thee we commend ourselves and all those for whom we pray. Where there is hatred, give love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is sadness, joy. Where there is darkness, light. Grant that we may not seek so much to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For in giving we receive, in pardoning we are pardoned, and in dying we are born into eternal life. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Ghost be with us all evermore. Amen.
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. It's not often I get a captive audience, but you're very welcome to be here, and I hope having shared what you feel, you'll also listen to what we have to say. And after the service, through the north transept, uh, there'll be the opportunity to discuss it further. I'll be out there and we'll be glad to talk about what both you've been saying and what I'm about to say. Are you on our side or are you on the side of our enemies? He replied, no, neither. I have come as commander of the Lord's army. There had been rioting on the streets. Poverty and crime were endemic. The government had undertaken a program of cutting welfare benefits and jobs in the teeth of considerable opposition from the trades unions. The Church of England, under its liberal archbishop, had decided to use its networks to tell the story of what was going on in the inner cities of Britain and make some suggestions about how we could respond. The year? 1985. The report? Faith in the city. The reaction from some in Mrs Thatcher's government was, you might say, intemperate. The Church of England was accused of being Marxist and derided as being anti-government. But the outcome of that report was in part to encourage the government in later years to begin to get to grips with the deprivation and regeneration in the inner cities. And for the church, its main legacy was the Church Urban Fund, which over the last 25 years has raised and spent over £60 million to change people's lives in thousands of projects in poor places around the country. In Bradford, where I was dean before I came here, the Church of England, with CUF help, has been running over 100 social projects, including teaching English to shut in Asian women, caring for the homeless, running lunch clubs for the elderly, youth clubs for deprived city children, and caring for vulnerable young people. When the Faith in the City report was published, I was just a curate down the road a few miles away in Deptford, rather a long way from St Paul's in many ways, working with the kinds of problems that the Faith in the City report identified. And my vicar and I wrote a submission to the committee that wrote it. That report was not comfortable reading for the comfortable church. It was not comfortable reading for people who normally read the Daily Mail. But it aimed to tell the truth. And not only to tell the truth, but to ask the question, how can we inside and outside the church work together for the common good, work to change things? That may not sound like a radical question, but at the time when Mrs Thatcher's government had been seen to wage war on the unions, and in particular to go through the bitter miners' strikes of 1984 and 85, a movement away from the them and us mentality of conflict between the government and the miners or other social groups, and to say that we were one society was itself a radical step. I don't know whether you watch TV documentaries, but the broadcaster Andrew Marr has been doing a modest little series on the life of humanity throughout the ages. One of those rather tiresome documentaries that consists an awful lot of people running around doing imaginative reconstructions with a lot of blood involved. But he made the comment in the first programme, which I think is very important, regarding the rise of humanity, that it was our tribal mentality that enabled human beings to survive and to colonise the world, and the tribal mentality that leads to violence and exploitation and destruction of those who are different from you. One of the key things about religious faith is that it should stand against human tribalism. It calls into question our view that our group and what we say must be right. 
Of course, religion gets used to justify the violence of the tribe, but that's a perversion of what lies at the heart of true religious faith. And you can see that in the two readings that we've had in our service today. In the first reading, the tribe of the Israelites is violently invading the land of Canaan in the name of God indeed. And Joshua, the Israelite leader, sees a man standing with a drawn sword in his hand and goes up and asks him the question, are you one of us or are you one of them? And the man replies, neither. I'm on God's side. And as the story unfolds, it appears that God's interests tend towards those of the Israelites, though interestingly, not entirely. And throughout the Jewish Bible, it's important to note that the theme that God is actually on everyone's side will keep reappearing. God is not only the God of Israel, but is also the God at work in the lives and the destiny of Israel's enemies and neighbors as well. And is also the God who calls the people of Israel to account for the way in which they financially exploit others and for their lack of justice. And in the New Testament too, Jesus prophesies against his hometowns because they refuse to accept the message of the kingdom of God. He says even that the notorious sinners of Sodom would be better than you in listening to what God says. And the reading goes on to call everyone to follow after Jesus Christ in the way of God's kingdom, the way which is gentle and humble, not violent, not discourteous, concerned for all, rather than promoting its own power and interests. What does all this have to do with last year's Occupy protest outside the London Stock Exchange? It's important because it puts that protest into the context of the good of all. The media work along tribal lines. They tempt us to do the same, because simple narratives of conflict between two different groups sell papers, and they're much easier to write stories about than the complex human realities that we usually face. The key messages from Occupy, as I understood them, are twofold. The first is that we need not only ethical and responsible finance, but a reform of our financial system so that it works for the good of everyone, not only in this country, but also around the world in a way which is just and sustainable. And the other message is that finance isn't something apart from our human relationships. In order to have a just society, we have to take account of the value of everyone, all people, and therefore must address the failure of our democratic system to involve and empower its citizens. Occupy's messages are important and powerful and urgent, and they need to be acted on. But what's uncomfortable for those who think in tribal terms is that there are many voices within the financial and political worlds which are also calling for change. I heard the Lord Mayor in the Guildhall last week speaking of work being done by many in the city to promote cultural change so that fairness, honesty and justice are to be reasserted against the selfishness and corporate irresponsibility of much modern banking practice. And that's good as far as it goes. And it shows that simple tribal hostility, bankers on one side, occupy on the other, is too simple a stereotype. But just changing the culture is not enough. You have to have systemic change, because good, decent and honest people can still operate a system which is unjust and is not to the benefit of all. Our concern as Christians is not with one part of humanity, but with all. Ed Miliband's call to have one nation is all right as far as it goes, but it doesn't go far enough. 
We need not one nation. We need one world, a world to which all of us belong. And that's why the concerns of Occupy are still urgent and relevant, as they were 25 years ago when Faith in the City was written, as they were about 400 AD. One of the statues up here is a statue of a man called John Chrysostom, one of the statues around the dome. He was the Archbishop of Constantinople around the year 400. He was exiled and starved to death by the Roman Emperor of his day because he denounced the obscene wealth and conspicuous consumption of the Imperial Roman Court in Constantinople and set alongside that exploitation of those in desperate poverty was a Christian church engaged in redistributing wealth in a way which threatened the foundations of the status quo. For me, coming here to St Paul's and having been here just a few months, one of the sad things I've found is the way that the media set Occupy over against St Paul's as two tribes in conflict. I know the story of the camp was a very difficult one on both sides, as a complex story and mistakes made by all. But the simple headline is that St Paul's has been working for the last eight or nine years through its institute to work on matters to do with finance, governance and sustainability, and over the last year has taken up the Occupy agenda to make that work better. And at the moment, in the cathedral too, we're seeking to listen to what God is saying to us about how we need to change and develop in order to better express the Christian values of love and justice that we believe in and we want to share in the service of all people. We can do that because we believe that God is on the side of all of us and God is on the side of none of us. God in Jesus Christ affirms us all and challenges us all. That's what the kingdom of God means. It means living in a world where God rules, not us. Where what we think is right must always be confronted by God's call to love and to act with justice. Where all of us must be open to be challenged when often we become merely tribal. And my hope is that all of us will be committed to working for the kingdom of God and doing that together. We need partners, allies, people with a vision for love and justice and the common good. Whether they're bankers or campers, conservatives or liberals, religious or not. God's invitation to us is to follow Jesus Christ and to change ourselves and the world in a way that's inclusive and generous and calls all of our vested interests into question. Whether it's the interests of St Paul's or the Church of England or Occupy or the City of London. Joshua said to the man with the drawn sword, Are you for us or are you for our enemies? And he said, No, I fight for the kingdom of God. Amen.